My name is Monk Rowe. We're filming today for the Hamilton College Jazz Archive. That's a special day for us because we're here with one of the kings of the trumpet, Sweets Addison. Thank you. It's a great pleasure to have you here. It's a pleasure. It's a compliment to me that you even invited me to do it. I feel honored. Well, we are in the, in the process of getting some stories from some of our greatest <coughs> musicians in the country. <coughs> Excuse me. And we uh, are very thrilled to have you here. It's a thrill and, to be here. And interested in hearing your stories and, of course, where you got your nickname. I have to ask that, but... Well, <laughs> when I first joined the Count Basie Band in 1938, uh, Lester Young, he was my roommate. And uh, he had a knack for giving names to people that mm -hmm. always stuck, you know. So he gave me the name of Sweets. He gave Billy Holiday the name of Lady Day. He named her Lady, and named himself Prez. He named himself. Named himself all right. Prez. So uh, that name has stuck with me all my life. In fact, uh, I don't know of anyone that calls me, that called me by my name. That was my mother. She passed away a couple of years ago at 90 years old. Mm -hmm. She called me Harry. But uh, everybody else calls me Sweets. I think it fits. And I don't playing. know why he named me Sweets, but uh, it's it's an uh, interesting name, and uh, I know it can't be because I'm so sweet. <laughs> oh, maybe mm -hmm. the notes you played. Is that? Do you think we? I don't know. I don't know. The tone you had. I don't know. Uh, I never did ask him. I just yeah, just took it. just took the name. Yeah, yeah because it was an honor for. Him. Uh, for me to be named by Prez, you right. know, he was such a great artist. He was yeah. a fantastic uh, musician, not only a great tenor player and a stylist, he was a good musician. Mm -hmm. Played wonderful clarinet, but uh, Benny Goodwin gave him a clarinet at one time when we played a dance someplace and somebody stole it, so he never did play it anymore. Oh. He never played clarinet. I'd heard that story, but not the end of it. Yeah, it's too bad. Yeah. When you were young... Um, yesterday. Yesterday, when you were yeah. young. <laughs> Sounds like a song. Yeah. Let's write it. <laughs> when you were growing up, was the, there certain influences that, that, that led you to the trumpet? Yes. Louis Armstrong. He was my idol. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, I was born in Kentucky, and... Uh, Moved to Columbus, Ohio when uh, I was six months old, so I didn't uh, know too much about Kentucky. I went back when I was five and stayed with my uh, grandparents there for about seven years, whom he taught, my uncle taught me the scales on the trumpet, and he was never a school professionally. Mm -hmm. He just picked music up, so he, uh, he taught me the scales. And uh, I've uh, tried to play ever since. I didn't want to play, but after I heard Louis Armstrong play, I had no doubts that I wanted to try to be a trumpet player. I'm still trying. When, when you say you heard him, was there uh, records in your house? Oh, yes. Yes. Yes, my mother had music all the time, mm -hmm. all kind of records, you know, Louis Armstrong, Bessie Smith, Mamie Smith, uh, all the blues. Oh, Any kind of blues record that you wanted to hear, she had it, you know. So, uh, blues and spirituals mm -hmm. all through uh, all through my house there. And uh, But Louis Armstrong, uh, he was just indescribable. There's no, there's no words that you can, uh, Describe Louis Armstrong with because he was such a phenomenon on that trumpet. He uh, he did what uh, he done a lot of things on the trumpet that the uh, echelon said couldn't be done. Mm -hmm. Great trumpet teachers like Bach, Schlossberg, other uh, music teachers, Dal Steger said couldn't be done, but he did, and he never had a lesson. He was an orphan, 
you know, and yeah. uh, picked up the trumpet, a little cornet, and he made history. Did you have an opportunity to hear him? Oh, yes, I met him. He was a very dear friend, very dear friend. Uh, he used to, uh, I was playing here at the Memory Lane Club. Oh, while he was living, he used to come to here quite often. And he used to come to the Memory Lane Club to listen to me. You know, he was a great friend. Uh, you never said anything while he was talking, but every, because everything that he said, you, you wanted to just grasp, you know, he had so much experience. In fact, he was the ambassador of one of the oldest forms of art and culture we have in America, mm -hmm. which is spirituals, blues, and jazz. That's the oldest form of art that we have here in America. And he was the, uh, oh, he took jazz all over the world. In um, 1976, I think it was, I went to the Middle East for uh, the government, the United States, as uh, uh, they were trading uh, artists at the time, you know. They had artists come to America, and we went through the Middle East. We went to Istanbul, Turkey, Tehran, Damascus, Jordan, Egypt, Kuwait, and uh, we played the university there in uh, Cairo. And uh, the first thing the guy asked me was, do you play like Sachimo? He was just, in fact, they have a library there in Cairo of nothing but Louis Armstrong records wow. in the university. And that, I don't think we have that here in America, I don't think. It's been a great gift of our country to, oh, yes. to the world. Yes, yeah. yes, to the world. Yeah. He was, uh, he played, I don't think he missed any place on this earth playing. He played just about every place and played for royalty. They appreciated him over there very much. Mm -hmm. In fact, Europeans appreciate jazz music more than Americans, although it's American art form. Yes. But uh, it's appreciated more in Europe. And as you know, a lot of the musicians have uh, migrated to Europe because right. they appreciate them more than they do here in America. Mm -hmm. Like the great, late, great Ben Webster, Don Bias, uh, Stuff Smith, uh, Rex Stewart, Benny Carter lived in Europe for years. There's just so much appreciation for you over there. You, you, uh, you're loved for what you can do, mm -hmm. you know. And it is an art. I think you, jazz musicians should be given the same respect as uh, concert musicians. Yeah. Because we devote our lives to uh, improvising on a melody, and that's not easy to do. And uh, concert musicians, they, they, uh, they exert themselves mechanically, you know. They, they play a note. If it's a quarter note, it gets one beat. If we play a quarter note, it might get one beat or half a beat or whatever, any way we feel. Mm -hmm. And uh, to improvise on a melody for five, six, seven, eight, nine courses, it's not easy. No, it's not. It's not easy. It's, you know, it's a, is it a skill that that you learned? Um, how did you learn that skill? Can you describe that? Yes, because in my era, uh, as you know, there was a lot of prejudice toward the musicians because we couldn't play in a studio band. They had radio bands that were getting paid weekly. They were on a salary. They had musicians here at uh, Fox Studio, MGM, Metro and Mirror. They were, they were on the staff, and they got paid whether they work or play. Mm -hmm. But they didn't have black musicians there at the time. So our only course was to play solos. And when you pick up your horn, you, you get your uh, Georgia Brown or something, whatever that came to your mind to play, you would improvise on that. Mm -hmm. And that was the only way that you could uh, um, that you could exist, you know, is, uh, is play jazz because there was no place for us to play but uh -huh. in dance halls. Uh, uh, I joined Count Basie in 1938 and we used to do like 300 one-nighters a year. 
you know, where Benny Goodman or one of those bands would be in a hotel six months uh -huh. in New York and the hotel in uh, Chicago for three months, you know, they always were on, uh, they were always uh, sitting someplace where they could play ball or whatever they wanted to do. They could be with their families, yeah. you know. But we had to take to the road. Mm -hmm. And uh, as I was telling Wenton Marcellus, I made a CD with him last week. And uh, I told him that, uh, you know, there were quite a few good legitimate trumpet players years ago, but they had no place to play. Mm -hmm. There was one guy, uh, Russell Smith. <clears throat> he was the greatest student, Bach head. He learned the trumpet. Oh, there was nothing, no kind of concert trumpet he couldn't play. Uh, but he couldn't get a job. Mm -hmm. So he had to go with Fletcher Henderson for the rest of his life. So uh, why, uh, why should I waste five or six years learning the finer points of my horn when I couldn't work? Mm -hmm. So I started playing solos in Columbus, Ohio. My mother bought me a trumpet, paid 50 cents down on it and 50 cents a month. It cost $12.50. So. Uh, that was the greatest present I ever had. Mm -hmm. And the uh, first thing I wanted to do was play a chorus on one of Louis Armstrong's uh, melodies that I heard on one of his recordings. I'm confessing that I love you. And uh, that inspired me to be a trumpet player. But uh, uh, those trumpet players in those days, Wendell Cully, I imagine you'd Remember the pretty solo he played on Little Darling with Count Basie? Yeah, they were he just was, yes, he talking was from, about that, yeah, that section from, that he was in. Yes, yeah. he was from Boston, and one of the finest students Schlossberg had. And his, uh, his ambition was to play in the Boston Pops, because he was from Boston. But uh, he ended up with Noble Sissel. He couldn't get a job. Mm -hmm. you know, they, they didn't hire black musicians and symphony bands in those days. So we all ended up doing one-nighters. You know, we'd pass each other on the road going to uh, Birmingham, or Texas, or Mississippi. We played every nook and corner in the United States. What was that life like? Being young as I was, I was having a ball. Mm -hmm. I loved it, you know. But as you get older, it takes its toll. Yeah. And. Uh, after the big bands sort of diminished because dance halls diminished, small bands uh, began to thrive, you know, like the John Kirby band. Uh, he's the one that, the Nat King Cole trio. They had small bands, yeah. you know, because you played in clubs and it was like a concert instead of a dance. Right. Like uh, Savoy Ballroom, uh, they had dancers, you know, they danced all night. Uh, nobody wanted to uh, sit and listen because they wanted to feel that, that, uh, that fire that the band had, you yeah. know, the impulse from the, from the musicians to the dancers, you know, that feeling that they had together would make you want to dance, you know. But now uh, it's altogether different. It's, uh, you play a concert when you're playing, like tonight, you know. Right. Everybody was listening. Well, how do you feel about that? How did it, that affected the music? Do you think it was a... Oh, it, 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 uh, it had its toll on jazz because there are no more big bands. Uh, they all, I think the only uh, Count Basie band, the Duke Ellington band, but it's not like, uh, right. not like the leader was there. Uh, like uh, if you cut the head of a snake off, the tail dies. Yeah. And the head of the snake was like the band leader, like yeah. Count Basie. Regardless what he played when he was there, you miss seeing him, and he, he had an aura about him that everybody loved. Everybody loved Count Basie. Everybody loved Duke Ellington. The mm -hmm. big bands were so popular in those days until, uh, uh, and they, most of the musicians in those days demanded respect mm -hmm. because they were an artist. And uh, they were all individualists. Everybody had a sound of their own. Uh, they could be identified on the record, like if Billie Holiday would sing on a record, you know it's nobody but Billie Holiday. She's the only one sounds like that. 
if uh, Louis Armstrong, after he can hit one note on a record, you know it's Louis Armstrong. Nobody sounded like Lester Young, like Coleman Hawkins, like Bunny Berrigan, like Benny Goodman, uh, Chew Berry, Dizzy Gillespie. They all had a sound that they could be recognized. And that was our ambition in my day, to not be an imitator, but an originator, you know. Yeah. And as they used to say, they would rather be the world's uh, worst uh, originator than the world's greatest imitator. <laughs> because there's nobody like the man that first sounded like that. You right. can never, uh, you can never uh, capture mm -hmm. his feeling. So uh, we all wanted to be individualists. I made many, many records with Billie Holiday, and it was always a joy just to be in her company mm -hmm. because she was uh, she was uh, just absolutely. I met her when she was about 19 years old, and what a voluptuous, beautiful girl she was. She was absolutely just uh, she was just gorgeous, and uh, she had a sound that when you hear her on a record, you know that's Billie Holiday, you know, and uh, that's what we strived for in those days. Nowadays, it seems like uh, musicians have their idols and they don't, they don't venture any place else but what their idol is playing, like yeah. Charlie Parker. Uh -huh. Uh, everybody, everybody, all the alto players sound like Charlie Parker. All the tenor players nowadays sound like John Coltrane. Mm -hmm. uh, all the trumpet players either sound like Miles or Dizzy. So there's no originality now, mm -hmm. nowadays with the musicians. Uh, I think uh, Wenton, he's uh, Marcellus. He's trying to get him a sound of his own like he can be recognized. But he's a Miles Davis disciple. And uh, John Faddis is a Dizzy Gillespie right. disciple. He plays exactly like Dizzy played when Dizzy was young, mm -hmm. you know. So uh, I uh, like super sax. They don't play anything original. They play. Uh, they, uh, they've taken Charlie Parker's records off, uh, solos off the records, and they put them to harmony. Yeah. There's, there's nothing original about yeah. that. Yeah, you know? I guess it's a, it's a tribute of a sort. But, it is a tribute, sure. But, uh, well, you know, finding that original sound, I guess, is... Well, we did it in our day. You sure did. Uh, not that I, uh, my sound is to be, uh, you know, I don't know anybody that, sounds like me and I don't blame them, you know, but... Well, there's uh, a number of people along the way who wanted your sound, that's for <laughs> sure. <laughs> well, I've, uh, I've, uh, in my era, like, the, it was so much competition. It was very competitive in New York at that time. And uh, Charlie Shavers, there's so many good trumpet players and they all had their own style. Mm -hmm. They had their own sound. There was no doubt when you heard them playing, you could be 10 miles away in the air and play, say, that's Charlie Shavers, that's Dizzy, that's Louis Armstrong, you know, that's uh, Red Allen. Uh, Bunny Berrigan had a good sound of his own. But uh, Teddy Wilson, he had a style yeah. which was simple but beautiful, you know. And, and the Basie band itself had a style. Oh, that, sure, sure. Know. How many years did you spend with? Well, Basically. from 38 until 1950, then I went back, then I uh, got a studio job here at ABC and uh, with Mitchell Ayers on the Hollywood Palace, and then I started playing with Frank Sinatra. I did everything with him and mm -hmm. Nelson Riddle for about 13 years. I recorded a lot with Nat King Cole, Ella Fitzgerald. Uh, I've been blessed all my life. I, it seems like that... Uh, uh, I don't know uh, why, uh, you know, uh, uh, I've been called to do records like this. Anybody could have done it, you know. 
But, yeah, but uh, like like you stated, you know, you, you had your sound. Yeah. Uh, well. You must have developed a sound that, that people recognized and that when Frank Sinatra did a date, he knew who he wanted to hear behind him, as did Nelson Riddle. Well, know. it was it was uh, funny how that happened because uh, the first date I did with Frank Sinatra, uh, I, I was in the brass section and I started playing little things behind him in the mute. And then later on, they didn't give me any music. They just sat me on a stool and put the earphones on and said, just play whenever you get ready. Oh, that's interesting. So that was quite an honor. Yeah. You know, that was quite an honor. I did that for about 13 years with him. And I played with Hank Mancini, uh, made a uh, soundtrack for movies, the uh, latest things of blues. I've done, uh, I've been fortunate, God has blessed me, because I have uh, been chosen to do things, I guess, just because of my sound, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, I'm still trying, you know. I, I, uh, what little success that I have, and I still have, I'm grateful, mm -hmm. you know. God has blessed me, as I said before. And uh, I've tried to carry myself in a well, uh, as I always say in my era, we had a lot of respect for each other. Yeah. Musicians had so much respect for each other. And New York was such a beautiful place to be at that time because uh, it was so competitive. When I first went to New York, I, uh, I couldn't get any sleep. I stayed up so long till I fell out in 7th Avenue one night and had to go to the hospital. I just stayed up. So much I, going on. I couldn't, couldn't miss. Oh, I just <laughs> couldn't go to bed. You know, I had to. I lived on 130th and 7th Avenue. Art Tatum was playing on 131st Street. Don Redmond was playing across the street at 132nd Street. Billy Holiday was singing at 138th Street at a place called the Yeah Man Club. There was Small's Paradise on 135th Street. Everything was in Harlem. You know, you could walk. And I walked so much till I just passed out. I just couldn't miss anything. You know? oh. So uh, uh, everybody was, it was, uh, you could see everybody that you wanted to see in the daytime on 7th Avenue. Mm -hmm. Louis Armstrong, Ellington, James P. Johnson, Willie the Lion was at the Rhythm Club. It was just, you know, it was, it was amazing. And it held my, uh, I just, I was just, I was in awe at all these people that I had seen on the stage in Columbus, Ohio, to dance, Cab Calloway. Here I am, walking down 7th Avenue, you know, and uh, looking at these people, you know, and saying hello to them. And Count Basie introduced me to all these people. Uh -huh. He was uh, like a father. When I first joined the band, I was 19, and he just wow. took a liking to me, and he introduced me to Ellington, uh, James P. Johnson, Art Tatum, uh, Louis Armstrong, oh my goodness. It was just absolutely a thrill. At the time you joined the Basie Band, how much of the music was written? We didn't out? have any music. That's, that was my question. No, well, how did that work? And how did you well, learn what to play when you first got in a... Well, uh, that's an interesting question. Because when I first joined the band, Everybody in the Count Basie band had played with Benny Moten's band. Mm. So they all knew what they wanted to, wanted to play. They all had notes to different, like um, One O'Clock Jump, uh, uh, Swing in the Blues, uh, Out the Window. It was a head arrangement, you know. They just, the, the brass section would get together and they would uh, play uh, set a riff, you know, behind a melody, bass would play on the piano. The saxophone would go to another room and they would set a riff. And when we all came back to the rehearsal hall, we'd all have an arrangement, you know. So uh, that went on with me for about a couple of years. And finally, I told Basie, I said, I'm going to quit. Well, he said, why? You sound good. I said, well, uh, all these arrangements that you play every night, I can't find a note, you know. I can't find a note to uh, 
swinging the blues, playing it fast. I haven't had a chance. I really was uh, uh, disgusted. Discouraged, huh? Yes. Yeah. So he said, I'd rather for you to take my notice. He said, well, if you find a note tonight and it sounds good, play the same damn note every night. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that's what I did. You know, he, he, he encouraged me to, to sit there. And it was very difficult because uh, when they play a tune like Out the Window or, or uh, uh, of course, One O'Clock Jump wasn't too fast. You could find a note. But uh, jumping at the woodside, Hell, they plan, you know, and you, they're trying to find a note to play. It's past, it's, you know, you, you're finished. They're finished before you can find a note. You know? <laughs> there's no there's no rehearsal time no, to do that. You're playing every no, night, yeah, right? Sure, sure. But uh, he encouraged me, and I stayed there for almost, for 20 years in and out, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, had it not been for Count Basie, I wouldn't be here with you because nobody would have never heard about me. Mm. He gave me a chance, and uh, I had so much fun. I don't know why he kept me with the band, because I was having a ball. You know, <laughs> every night was uh, fun to me, you know. Yeah. Just, just absolutely uh, sitting next to Lester Young. Gee whiz, what a thrill. You know, Joe Jones, Walter Page, uh, Freddie Green, Buck Clayton. I was sitting next to him. It wasn't but three trumpets. Buck Clayton, Ed Lewis, and myself. There was two trombones and four saxophones and uh, four rhythm section. Mm. So I just, I had, I should have paid him to be in the band because I was having so much fun. Amazing education. Oh my goodness. It, uh, you couldn't pay for that kind of an, uh, mm -hmm. education. And then to, you know, in New York, at that time, you worked from nine to four and they had many joints that you could go to after four that you could go and play. You, you worked know, from nine to nine four. Nine to four in the morning. And then uh, we'd go to a restaurant or someplace and get something to eat. And then they had places where trumpet players would go. All the trumpet players, we'd all end up there, as we used to call it, we'd cut each other mm -hmm. all night long till I stayed in there till one or two o'clock in the afternoon, you know. But uh, what a place to be, to learn the instrument. Huh. You know, Dizzy and all of us used to do that every morning. Charlie Shavers, uh, we'd go someplace every morning and, uh, and play. And that is like uh, a laboratory to someone who's trying to find a cure for a disease. He's in his laboratory. He's, you know, he's working. Yeah. Yeah. That is a laboratory. The After Our Jones was a laboratory for musicians because we could go there and just play and find yourself, you know. Uh, because when I first di heard Dizzy, he was playing exactly like Roy Elridge, mm -hmm. exactly like him. But going to the joints every night, you know, and playing and playing, you find, you, uh, you forget about him. your idol. And you you want to play what you, how you feel. You, you play your ideas. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. So they don't have that anymore for no, that's, musicians. You know. That's right. And it, maybe shows up in what you were saying oh, before, that oh, people get to a certain does. level, maybe, and they don't right. aren't able to find And they anything. don't have any more big bands, mm -hmm. because uh, in a big band, when you travel together for 300 one, one night, is you, you, you feel close to each other, mm -hmm. you know, it's, you, it's a family. Yeah. And uh, we were closer to each other uh, than we were our home because we were, we, were on the, we were with each other all the time, you mm -hmm. know? And that's, uh, there's no more uh, respect for each other like it was yeah. when we came up, you know? Like, it is, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's not sad now, but it's, uh, um, when I first started making, with Count Basie, we were making $9 a night. And uh, now, you know, they make 900 a night, mm -hmm. you know. They haven't paid their dues yet, but they yeah. want money, yeah. you know. But uh, I think all the older musicians that are making money, they sure in the hell deserve it because they, sure they have paid their dues. Yeah. Well, that's yeah. why we're here, too. Um, when you talk about some of the great singers, uh, mm -hmm. Billy Holiday and Frank Sinatra, did you ever have the opportunity to play behind Joe Williams? Oh, sure. Because of the... Uh, sure. 
I was the first band that he went on the road with when he left Basie. I had the band, and um, Basie was his manager, and I was working out of the same office. So Basie said, well, you two are about, uh, you know, you have that same Count Basie feeling, you know. So I think you'd make a good, uh, uh, make a good package. Mm -hmm. And we went out together for a couple of years, two yeah. or three years. Yeah. Uh, playing with singers are very enjoyable. Nat Cole was just absolutely, uh, he was a joy to work mm -hmm. with, you know. And uh, Ella Fitzgerald, Sarah Vaughn, I've uh, recorded many, many, many times with Ella. In fact, I made her last CD, which is called All That Jazz. And I made the last, C last CD of uh, Billie Holiday. Uh, called Lady in Satin. Uh, that was her last album. Yeah. And uh, she wouldn't do it until I got back to New York off the road. Mm -hmm. We were very, very, very good friends. Carmen McRae, I recorded with Peggy Lee, Bing Crosby, uh, just about everybody. Just about everybody. So, uh, as I uh, say all the time, God has blessed me. I I've been blessed, you know, and still being blessed because yeah. I'm sitting here with you. Tell us about what what you're doing in the future. Today. Yeah. Well, I'm not going on the road no 300 one nighters <laughs> anymore. That's for sure. I'm through with that. But uh, I have uh, I'm going to Chicago in the morning to play a festival with Clark Terry, and uh, the 13th I'm be at the uh, Hollywood Bowl, the last jazz series of the summer, tribute to Lionel Hampton, which is called Vibes, and uh, uh, going to Kennedy Center on the 8th to play, uh, play a concert there to, for the president with Lionel Hampton, and uh, going to Europe, going to Paris, at a place called the uh, Caveau de la Houchette. Oh. It's on the left bank there in Paris. I love Paris. I've been there many, many, many times. And you parlez vous français? Uh, petit peu. Non petit peu. Real petit peu. Petit peu. I, 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 uh, I uh, very fond of Paris. And uh, in fact, I've been all through Europe many, many, many times. I have a lot of friends over there. That's great. And I look forward to going over there to yeah. see my friends. You know? uh -huh. and, People um, have, have said that the, there's a difference in the way the music is, yes, is uh, yes. approached. And well, music gets you in many places that you would never think that you would be in, like uh, in school, I used to read about Egypt, the pyramids, and places like that, Turkey, Istanbul. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm a frustrated tourist. The girlfriend, <laughs> she made me a frustrated tourist because she's an a English professor. And because uh, I used to go there and never see anything. But what she came over with me, she had a tenere made out. We'd go to this place, this place, go to Marseille, go to see Versailles, go to. Uh, uh, oh, my goodness, uh, the Louvre, Notre Dame, oh, just so many places that music has opened the door for me to see. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Middle East, uh, I had the pleasure of having lunch with uh, Queen Aaliyah in Jordan. Um, she, the king, is a jazz fan, Hussein. And, uh, and uh, Rabat, we had lunch with the little princesses there. And uh, if I hadn't been a musician, there's no way yeah. the average layman would yeah. be in that, that uh, company, you know. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and I have enjoyed it. I have really, really enjoyed being in music business. I thank God every night for giving me the talent, wow. blessing me. It's wonderful. Um, before we wrap up, is there any... Uh, yeah, I'm getting hungry. <laughs> it's on its way. <laughs> Is there any uh, humorous or 
just really interesting stories you can share with us about either Basie or Joe Williams' time together that maybe we haven't read in a book? Well, there's not too much I could say about Joe because uh, he wasn't with the band that, uh, that I was with. I was with the original Tom right. Basie band. And, uh, and his, uh, his uh, hit came after of, your tenure. Is that every day? Oh, yeah. Like it's that after I had left the band yeah. in the 50s. And uh, Lester Young gave uh, Basie the name of Holy Man because he carried the money. He was the holy man. So. <laughs> and uh, we had to keep track of bases so we could get paid. <laughs> because he'd find have a bar or someplace and we wouldn't get any money. We wouldn't get no dough. It was, it was so much fun, you know. So many stories I could, I could, uh, I could tell, but they, you couldn't, uh, present them to the school, the stories. <laughs> you to clean them up a little bit, huh? Yeah. You could present them. Where did uh, he get the name The Chief? Do you remember that? Well, that was, after, that was after uh, I left the band. It was a count then. until a certain time yeah. when he became the chief. He was a holy man. Okay. He was a holy man. And then the, the, uh, the uh, late band with uh, Joe Williams and all of them, they call him The Chief. Okay. See, but before then, bless the young, Name of Holy Maine, you know. So uh, everybody had had a name. Lester gave everybody a name, and uh, he was he was so full of humor. If someone knew would come in the band, he had a little school bell that that he uh, put down beside him, and uh, if you didn't uh, play the way that you should, I mean, swing and everything, he'd take the bell and ring it. And uh, Basie would give you a notice, you know. No but, kidding. Yeah, that was. Uh, <laughs> it was a lot of fun, though. It was a lot of fun. We've been trying to get to uh, with some of the uh, alumni of the Basie band. What what it was about their rhythm section that was. Uh, I I so really special. don't I don't know. They were just together. There is no explanation, and you can't write what they played. Yeah. There was a feeling that they had uh, within themselves, you know, they could feel each other what, whichever way that Joe Jones would go, Walter Page would go. And uh, without Freddie Green, the rhythm section would really wouldn't sound as full as it was with mm -hmm. Freddie Green because he was the greatest rhythm yeah. guitar player ever lived. And Joe Jones, was so busy inventing a lot of things back there on the drums, sometimes it didn't even swing. But whatever he was doing, the drummers are still doing it, see. And uh, so many things that uh, Joe Jones, uh, uh, he presented to the drummers nowadays, like uh, broken rhythms. I think Max Roach is the only one that really gives him uh, uh, Pays tribute to Joe. He used to play uh, broken rhythms on the uh, on the uh, sock symbol. Joe Jones was the first one to ever do that, mm -hmm. you know, and playing on the pipe of the uh, of the uh, sock symbol with his stick, playing, playing, playing. First one to do that, you know. Because we used to look back and ask, what the hell's going on? It sounded like bells ringing back then. You see, you play your instrument, and I play mine. <laughs> yeah. So and we it, had a good time. It worked. Yes, it, worked. it did. Yes, it did. We have uh, just found out that you're going to be an honorary doctorate at Hamilton. Oh, I can't and wait. That is going to be a, a thrill for us. Yeah. But... Uh, uh, I can't wait to put the robe on and the cap. I, I, uh, I have a Duke Ellington fellowship to teach at Yale. Mm -hmm. And uh, Buck Clayton and I, we were uh, given a document for Harvard University yeah. before he passed away. Mm -hmm. But this is going to be uh, something that I'm going to look forward to right. in May. Uh, did you say May? I did say May. Well, if it doesn't happen in May, I know some pretty good guys 
that will uh, make it pretty hard up there on the campus. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're on film now, so it's yes. going to happen. Okay. okay. I'm well, looking forward to it. Thanks so much for your time. And thank you for inviting me.